Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is lecture 2.0. Here we're going to talk about how DNA sequence differences accumulate through, through time. We're kind of going to pretend that we can go back in time and watch sequence differences accumulate. And this is going to let us understand that there are shared mutations between close relatives and distinguishing mutations that separate different evolving lineages. Then in lecture 2p, we're going to use this to make inferences from modern sequences about evolutionary history. So I'm going to start just by looking at evolutionary trees for a minute. You've seen them before, but you might not have had anyone actually explain what you're looking at. So this is a simple evolutionary tree showing the relationships between a number of mammals. Here's humans. Now the first thing to know about this tree is that the modern living organisms are at the ends of the branches and that the ancestors are at the branch points. And so that tells you that time is going in this direction. Usually these diagrams cover long evolutionary periods. So this is now and this is long ago. The places where the branches come together represent the common ancestors of the organism. So this node, we call it, represents the point at which there was one lineage that was the ancestors of both humans and chimps. And at this point in time, so we can think of that as a time, at this time there was a what we call a speciation event, and this group of organisms became two different species that evolved independently along the different lineages. Same, here's the common ancestor of the larger group that also was the ancestor of gorillas, and then farther back we have the common ancestor of all of the mammals, including cats and dogs. Now this is a very simple tree, a more rich tree that goes much farther back in evolutionary time is shown here. This is the evolutionary relationships of all of the eukaryotes, all of the living organisms except bacteria and archaea. So in the simple tree, humans were here, in this more complex tree that goes farther back in time, not only all the mammals, but all the other animals, the cockroaches, the jellyfish, the sponges, the amoebas, are all in this little branch here. And all of the plants that grow on earth, all the land plants, are all here. All the rest of the tree is other organisms, many of things you probably never even have heard of, that represent the real rich diversity of eukaryotic life. We're just one specialized branch. We just happen to be big and smart. Now, you should be asking yourself at this point, wait, how do we know this? We weren't there. How can we know these evolutionary relationships? And the answer is, these were inferred by looking at DNA sequences in different living organisms, homologous DNA sequences, to identify what we call neutral sequence differences, changes, differences that don't reflect changing function, but that are things like, for instance, silent mutations, mutations in non-coding sequences. These accumulate more or less constantly over the generations because they're not noticed by natural selection. They don't do any harm. Natural selection doesn't care about them. They just accumulate. And if we understand how this accumulation happens, we're then prepared to read backwards in time from the differences that we see in the organisms that we can see, the organisms that are alive today, we can make inferences about what happened in the past. So here's a diagram representing land plants, um, four groups of land plants. On the right we have the onions and what the rest of the world calls, calls maize, but Americans call corn. 
on the right we have thistles and roses. Botanists know that these are quite different groups of plants. At the bottom of the tree, these but these are plants that are alive today. At the bottom of the tree, we have an ancestral plant. We know these plants all did share a common ancestor, but we don't know what its sequence was. We weren't there. But we can make inferences about it. So this ancestral plant, we're going to consider a DNA sequence in this plant. And it, maybe it's an intron sequence. It doesn't have any important sequence function. And we're going to follow how this sequence accumulates mutations through evolutionary time. So starting with this black sequence representing the sequence in the ancestor, I've drawn little vertical hatch marks to indicate mutations that have accumulated in the lineage that leads to maize and onions. If you're a botanist, you'll recognize that this is the group, the big group that botanists call monocots, and that thistle and, and rose are members of the big group called dicots. And the green lines mark mutations that accumulated in the lineage leading to the monocots. Because this lineage is evolving independently than the other, different mutations are going to arise just by chance and accumulate in the lineage leading to thistles and roses. We follow time farther forward. Once the two lineages leading to onions and maize diverge, once they're different species, they're also accumulating mutations independently. So in this lineage, we have blue mutations accumulating. In this lineage, we have yellow ones. And I've marked those with little lollipops. So you can see these are the yellow lollipop mutations distinguish maize from everything else. But the green line mutations are shared mutations between onion and maize. We know they're mutations because they're not present in the other lineage. They tell us that onions and maize are more closely related than the others. Similarly, in the dicot line, we have pink mutations accumulating. And then after the rose and thistle diverge, they accumulate their own lineage-specific mutations, but they share the mutational differences that arose in the lineage before they diverged from each other. So what we've done, we talked about a little bit about how to look at trees, why we look at trees, and we've drawn the accumulation of DNA changes over evolutionary time in a hypothetical scenario, but something that we know happened. We don't know exactly what the mutations were, but we know this divergence happened. Now, in the next lecture, we're going to talk about how we can use these accumulated sequence differences to work back to infer evolutionary history. I hope to see you there.